Xbox they can be very disappointed in how it sounded. Oh really? Everybody hates it. Mm. Now everybody hates their own voice. Do you know why? That's very mm. important because we're dealing with students from different countries, from different accents and so on. You hear yourself differently through your skull than when you hear yourself on the tape recorder. Do you see what I'm saying? As you talk, you actually yes. hear yourself within your head. So the frequencies yes, that and you I hear, heard myself yeah, the frequencies you heard yourself or heard mm -hmm. anyway. <laughs> anyway, so we hear people differently and we hear our voices on the tape recorder differently than if we heard us as we uh, hear ourselves through the um, skull as we talk. If you hear a phone mm -hmm. ringing, the ha I mean the house where the phone rings all the time. Anyway, no, okay. so what I wanted to point out today is um, what I wanted to do today is not so much to give it yet another class in theory, but just basically quickly run through one of the um, drafts that were sent to me. And we might actually together try to assess them and see how we could actually work with those ideas. So um, basically what I wanted to say is as follows. We are in the 21st century and 20, and 19th century or 15th century or whatever century teaching models are out. It's absolutely, they are not on. So anyone who has some mm -hmm. uh, experiences in the 19th century methodology and you want to bring them into an academic unit like ELA 200, it is just not on. So I would lose my mm -hmm. job. I would have nothing to research. I would be finished as a person and I would lose also myself if I were to teach what you see on the picture right now. Okay? It's just not mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very important. And I want students, when students construct their PowerPoints and their resource and think how they actually would go about, what they would do if they walked in into the class. I want students to actually have this picture on the mind. As soon as you see yourself doing what this picture shows, Trust me, it's wrong. And there are things right and there are things wrong. What makes it wrong? Yep. What do you think makes this picture wrong, Desley? Mm -hmm. I have nobody else to ask. I mean, any, anyway, this is just an excuse for us to compare and contrast. What Sorry. do you think? Yeah. What do you think, Desley, makes this picture wrong? Okay, Desley? so I see that. Okay, so the teacher's standing out in front of the class with a pen or whatever in her hand, and she's she's the principal knower. She's telling them what to think, what they're, they're all holding up the same, what looks to be the same answer at the same time. It's very um, right. so, static. It's, it's so, not a, a, a... So that's the point. We will need to explore through the practice and through theory what the concept of principal knower actually means. Because I know that a lot of our students, actually every semester, mm -hmm. I get a cohort where from say 100 students, 99 students believe that being a principal knower is just not on, right? Sometimes people, because of cultural reasons, actually can't really understand it or maybe they just don't have time to engage in the unit. But most of the time, emotionally, people hate it. But as soon as they create a PowerPoint, yep. it comes back, right? Because it's really yep. hard to remove out of our lives the things that we were raised on. Really hard. It's really hard not to speak yes, English. Hard, yes. If your mother and your father spoke English, right? It's really hard to all of a sudden wake up and speak Chinese. So what I want you to do now, everyone, is to go back to your heart, remove the culture of your of your upbringing, you know, in in, in schools of this type, mm -hmm. and we're trying to actually rethink. All right. So we're, it's not on. So the print. So the teacher is not the principal knower. So what does this mean? There are students who have their own what systems of meaning. They they have their own histories. They have their own little calculators in their mm -hmm. head, and what you think that it's in their heads, and what's actually in their heads is two different stories. This is really important. Yes. And how they perceive things is different. How they see things is different, and then, and at the mm -hmm. same time. If you so that's once that 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 is a most crucial point that most of the time gets mi uh, missed in textbooks, but the point which is probably included in textbooks of, in, in most of them is that there is no creativity here. We're training robots. 
people who can read the manual yeah. go to work and listen to commands. That's pretty much what it is. I'm not sure whether this is really the world, how it was in the 19th century. I'm not going to go into it, but that's pretty much what we don't want. We want people who are creative. So I'm spending so much time today, five minutes I've spent on talking about this model, because as soon as you see yourself doing this, remember, get out, do something, have a break, tell people to do something else and reflect or finish it off. But remember next time to change it. All right, so let's have a look at the particular model yeah. uh, that was taught. I just have to actually for a moment, um, I can't actually access my, um, okay. Can you still see the picture and everything? You should. Hi, Alina. Oh, hi. Who is here? Alina. That's great. Yeah. We've got more people here. Cool. All right. So let's have a look. So Alina, what we're doing today, rather than go into theory or practice or me explaining to you how things should be done or what I believe in, what we're going to do today, in my view, Yeah, this is the problem, Alina. They have to log out. If Bethany is stuck on another page, she has to log out and click on the little purple um, window or a little purple circle, which is next to the session. And, and I know LearnLine is really weird. So um, anyway, so what we're going to do today is actually look at one of our students' brave attempts to actually produce something that's in her head or in his head. And we're going to work with it. And one principle that we have in our mind is that we don't want the monetary model, right? We don't want the teacher who changed robots. Okay. Now I tried to actually work with editing this particular uh, uh, draft so that we could actually read. Now look what happens. There's a particular concept that the student has in her mind. It starts with a concept, which is oral language. What strikes you guys about this thing here straight away? All right. It doesn't matter what strikes you. What the first thing sh the, the student is suggesting to do is to, to, to read the book Fat Cat to the class. What do you think about this? Imagine now, you're young, you know, cool, at home you make jokes, your kids make jokes, whatever. You come to the class, you waltz in with the book, you sit down and you read the book to them. What do you think about it? Really cool? Surely, I mean, I, I guess no, it's boring. It's weird, isn't it? It's it's weird. I have made it really exaggerated because obviously you will people like who who have this intention and who do this, they probably you know wrap it in some nice talk. Oh, hello, children. Today we will read this book, and they all sit. Please sit on the mat and me like an old grandmother in the industrial age of the 19th century. I read to you a book. And what do they do? The good girls go, whatever you do, we will love it. And other people go like, I have a stomach ache. I'm not really sure what it is. What you need to do as a teacher, the first thing you do, you've got to make sure that whatever you do, kids must forget about the fact that they have a stomach ache. Kids must forget. What you need to do is to make sure that you actually put them on your side and you engage their interest, right? Coming there with your own agenda is actually no good. So what can we do? The, 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 the student who has submitted this draft says to us, I want them to read the book. No, I don't want them to read the book. I know I want them to know the story in that book. So what do we do? Say that she has or he has this wish. How do we satisfy it, it without actually get, getting into a situation where we waltz in with the book, put the kids on the mat and those who don't go on the mat quietly. We spend 20 minutes getting them there. And by the time I've seen classes like this because I've got, I go to students, I watch them teach. And by the time they actually do anything, they have like five or 10 minutes left because it's all about keeping them, you know, somehow stuck or whatever to the floor. <laughs> it's a challenge. All right. So we want to t we want them to, we want that book into go to go to their heads. What do we do? Imagination. Come on, guys. What do you do? So you make it interesting. You could do little reading groups. Some people could do their own things, like read over on the mat, like silent reading. Others could listen who want to listen, well, and then others could draw a picture they, of the cat. But they 
I don't want to read that book. No. Ah, I see you have a Well, book. I wouldn't make them. You wouldn't make them. Okay. Th that's 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 no. true. That's true. I wouldn't make them either, but there are ways of integrating a task like this and thinking about it laterally. There, there are always ways. So let, 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 let us think, for example. So what we could do is to connect this class to something that happened before. And you can say, remember how we do these thi did these things? Well, today I have brought, and you I have seen classes, by the way, just to make a um, set a scene. I have seen classes where I have seen teachers, not just our students, but the mentors of those students uh, do amazing things, amazing in a negative sense. I really have. And, um, and behind them, there was this this statement on the wall how you know we build confidence in our students whereas they were lifting up in the air children and throwing them out of the class i've seen that they were yelling at children throwing them out of the class and that on the wall above them was written we build confidence in our children and on top of it on the wall there was a huge screen of um, uh, uh, what is it called this um, smart board right a huge screen of a smart board does any one of you know how much is a smart board yeah, they're about seven thousand dollars installed with the projector and speakers. Okay, so they have doubled in price. They used to be, short, you know, uh, cheaper. Now they they have pretty much doubled in price within the last ten years or less. So within the last six years, they've well, I don't think they per se. Yeah, that that's the board. The board itself is about three and a half thousand dollars, and then you get a projector to go with it, and then the speakers and the keyboard and the you know, like the computer and everything. So you're looking at about dead set eight and a half. But now they're going to, um, they're forgetting the smart boards and they're moving into multi-touch screens. Yes, because the, not, but, yeah, there's a difference between the two. Okay, there is a difference with what you can do on both of them. But but the point is, in the school where I saw a teacher lifting up a child and throwing the child out of the classroom and then telling me that the child had an anger management problem, the whole school was fitted with smart boards. <laughs> every classroom, every classroom had $6,000 sitting there behind the teacher and the teacher was fighting with the children. Not our student, our student was fine. That's why probably there was a problem, right? But our student was fine. It's just that the teacher was just having a, an issue. Anyway, so you can actually display in the most interesting way things on the whiteboard. Make children click and see what they say. Make children actually click and listen to words. Make children actually try to repeat. Make children try to guess what the sentence will be. Make children actually interact with the text. The idea, and, and I have expanded on this example in my YouTube videos, which are on archives or somewhere, I don't know, I've produced so many videos, I lose track. Point is, the moment you walk in into the class and you read a story to children, you remove the power from the children. It's an old grandmother's model, right? I know it's done. I know people believe it. I know that many people teach it. Point is, for the 21st century kid, or any kid in fact, it's just a boring thing. They go home and they just play on stuff and they can get things in a more interactive way. This, there's no interactivity here. As you are looking into the text and reading it, what are the kids doing? And what are they getting out of it, really? They don't even know why they read it. What's the relevance for them, right? So you can create activities whereby even if you wanted this text to go into students' heads, heads, you can create activities where, which are interactive and which they have purpose for children. And the purpose could be a form of game whereby they actually might be relating, I haven't thought about it too much, but might be relating what they've done in, in the previous class to the things that you put, say, on the screen of the whiteboard, on, um, on the smart board. And they can clink, play, repeat, and run, and whatever. You have a mess in the classroom. Kids are doing lots of things, but they hear, they relate, they, they ask each other questions, they guess what is said, and so on. So you've got, 
And after a while, you can actually engage them and say, after they played and got something out of it, you can actually engage them with questions, what do you think it was about? And they will go and play some more to find information, and you can just let it go. And you can just let it go. How do you think I learned English when I came to Australia? Do you think that someone sat with textbooks in front of me and put the text in my head? Right? Ask an immigrant. It was like by clicking and hearing, by watching television and reading and exposing myself to all of these things and gradually putting all the things together in my head. I, I didn't even have a dictionary because there was no Polish English dictionary available when I came here. So it's interesting, isn't it? So when I'm saying you, you can do that, so the, 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 the straight away the idea of doing this sort of come in and read to students is just boring, irrelevant. So what I'm saying now is you need to think, as you design the class, you need to think of things like, why am I doing this? Why is it relevant to them? Why should they actually engage? All right, so now we can have a look at the other. Um, we've got another person here, Laurie. Oh, that's great. Laurie, what we're doing today is basically taking one student's draft and we're actually analyzing it in order to make sense of what I actually have in mind when actually thinking of assignment two. So we have looked at the concept of that book, of reading the book. We said it's actually not on because there is no relevance to children and, and it's not, not an interactive activity. Okay. So what do we do next? The book, a fat cat, uses 13 letters, which makes it easy for children to start reading without delay. Well, I don't know. Do you know children have amazing brains? But let us leave it there for a second that maybe we can actually live with it. So if the book is that easy, why start with us reading the book when we can actually engage children in trying to guess how to read it? Another thing they could do, have you actually explored uh, the avatar. Have you ever actually gone to the to the video with the avatar? There is this software which is the avatar online. It's free. Children can take words from the text on Fat Cat and type into the avatar one word, two words, the whole sentence, and make the avatar read it. And the avatar is really funny because as you move the mouse, the avatar moves its head or its f eyes. So the kids find it funny. But how empowering it is when kids take the text and mimic. Um, what do you mean by the cat is amazing? The, the, this Desley. The cat that does it. The cat that does it. It's a, it's a kitty cat and he's an avatar of a fat cat. And he, you say to him and he repeats back what you say. All right. Well, I haven't seen it, but I've seen the avatar as a human. But of course, we can have an avatar as a cat. I don't know what is out there. I mean, I'm a little bit stuck in the last year. There must be some other things that have come up. And there are uh, games, not games, applications on iPad that I don't, I'm not really good at. But they are there to explore and check the avatar. So imagine the kids don't know what the story is about. Right? And imagine if you give them the, this, this first page or whatever, and they put sentences or text or words into their little avatar, pre-literate children. And they type, they learn. What do they learn? They learn the association of the letter with the keyboard, letter with the keyboard, letter with the keyboard, and the sound. And when they mistype, instead of typing cat, they, they type C-A-P. What is the avatar going to say? He's going to say cap. Amazing they will find out that there is a difference between actually that, that what you type matters. And it's magnificent. Sure, the lesson will not look like a 19th century lesson where you come to the classroom, you make them quietly sit on the uh, mat, and you hope like crazy they will, and then you read because you do, and they just repeat after you, and they do all the things you want them to do. They just behave like marionettes. But what is it that you want out of it? What are the general capabilities saying that you actually are uh, complying with here? You're complying with nothing. This is an industrial model. Okay, so well, so basically what I'm saying is there are interactive tools that are available to us. You can do them with computers and without computers. I recommend you do both, right? But I will be 
doing a lot of um, exercises with you and stressing the use of computers for a number of reasons. One of them is that you actually need to know what is out there and know how to work with it. Because not using computers because you don't know what is out there and how to work with it is not an excuse, right? It is, I mean, this unit has to teach you particular things and one of them is to find out how to work with those tools. So there are avatars, kids can type and you don't have to worry that the lesson is not moving as smoothly as it did a hundred years ago, right? It's not supposed to. What we're trying to do is enable children to compare and contrast relationships of which you have no idea. We have no idea what happens in those kids' heads. But when we give them interactivity and games and enable them to actually type first the words and see what the avatar says, and then we can have a competition. How many of us actually can type the word without looking at the text? And the avatar says what it's supposed to say. It may look how they're learning to read and write instantly. And they get, they have a competition, they get involved, they love it, right? It's, 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 it's just ongoing and it's, so it's, it's great. Now, and as you actually, as kids are doing this, these kinds of interactive activities, what you do then, you engage them f close, further and further with guessing what it's all about. So they might be actually putting words from the, from wherever on the page into their avatar uh, uh, on the iPad. It doesn't matter. By the lesson two, three or four, they will get the whole story and they will love it because they've worked with it in so many different ways that they just love it because they understand it. They find it manageable as opposed to us throwing on them the whole story at once and then asking them to go through exercises. So it's a very important point. And in fact, it's so important that it would have been okay now just to finish it, to leave you all with thinking of how to create the lesson one. But um, let's have a look here for the, this um, draft. It repeats what you say. Okay, well, that's great. It's great. Um, but the one I'm talking about, and uh, I've made um, references to it and given links in PowerPoints, uh, which are available to you. I've made that, uh, I've, it's, it's, a, it's an avatar on, um, um, that, that actually reads what you say. All right, the book uses one basic vowel sound. Well, we don't know whether it's basic, right? You've got to stop those words basic. You have no idea how complex languages and processing is. People call it basic. A is not an A because um, it's, it's, it's a representation. If A was an A, then you would always hear it. But very often we don't hear what other people say. Sometimes it's an A and sometimes it's an A uh, and sometimes it's an A uh, and sometimes it's whatever, even though it's spelled A. So A is another A. So no, there's nothing basic about sounds. There's nothing basic about the world. So the, back, the, the book uses one, base, one vowel sound, A. Repeated often, the vowel and many consonants become completely memorable. So what we have, we have a cat, mat, I don't know what else we can have, some other things, right? Set on the mat and set on someone else's mat, whatever. Okay, I get the things, so there's this reiteration there. Wonderful. Aesthetically, what does it do? Right? Because what I'm saying now is if we teach literacy, we teach understanding how to work with language in order to achieve things. We don't do anything for nothing. We do things in order to achieve things. So why would, if we actually use this fact that this book or, uh, uses cat, mad, sad, dead, whatever, um, be great. But why should we expose children to that? Or oh, because we want to put these things into their heads. Oh my God, it just doesn't, we won't. I can tell you from neuroscience, I can tell you straight ahead, straight away, you're not gonna put these things into their head. Those people who already have a room for it, they will, but most people will not actually get the point. And they're not interested because you're putting them here through exercises. You're not, they're not actually engaged in the, in, the, in the act of communication for which literacy was invented. They're actually engaging through some, in, in, in some exercise. Exercise whose purpose only the teacher knows and that's probably not even ac accurate. You see guys, when we do these, these lessons, we need to be really thoughtful so um, it's not very simple. It's not what we have known and it's not just as simple as to put an exercise and get them today to do the A, tomorrow we do the B and tomorrow next day we do C because look at this, there's more than just A. There's a T and D and, and God knows what else is here. 
and there is no purpose. Now, one story that you may miss if you watch my lectures or don't um, is the fact that language, the way I use it at this very moment when I talk to you, it's a musical instrument and it sits in my right brain. But the language for reading and writing sits in the left brain. Well, the rhyme doesn't do anything yet, whoever is asking, because, I don't know, sorry guys, I, I'm not following all the conversations, but doing rhymes, oh, actually, rhymes is everything. But remember, if you do things in order to put children through exercise, what you're not doing is teaching them literacy. Literacy, is as, as we discussed last week, was invented in order to help people manage information, in order to do things, right? Here, they don't do anything. They don't do anything. All they do is just go and throw hoops, do rhymes do some reading, do some clicking, do some something. They need to do something. Creativity and critical thinking. Has creativity and critical thinking gonna happen when we just make them, let's rhyme now, let's repeat, let's listen. Where's the creativity here? All right? So all my lectures, all of them, in fact, and some of them are quite repetitive, address these issues. That's why I say you need to actually engage in the materials I give you, because otherwise all these things happen. They are artificial exercises. Um, so what was I saying here? So the vowel is repeated. It, it, it gets us nowhere, so what it gets repeated. But if you actually do look into poems, and if you do look into funny ways, like um, in English literature, we have this Dr. Seuss or so, right? And whatever. These people in those texts created for children actually use language in an aesthetically pleasing way. For example, in order to create a mood, which is to be funny, to be quick, to something, to, cre to create an effect, right? And we could play with that. Why? Because we want to explore it so that we could then use it in order to create our own story. Well, wow. then it's interesting. Then I know why I'm doing all these things, because I want to create a funny card for my mother for her Mother's Day. Right? We, we make it rhyme and so on. Now, I, I'm not actually taking you through steps of how to do it. I'm just today just assessing a draft that was sent to me by a student so that we can actually see uh, or, or inspect my views on it and, and contextualize it in terms of the resources that we have in this unit. And you see the assumption students then will work in pairs. Well, it would be really nice if they did, but they pull each other's hairs, they scratch each other, and some of them just fall asleep. And most of all, what happens, we're taking students here, we assume that it's good for them to just do what we tell them, but there's no engagement, right? And it doesn't matter whether I agree with particular t um, research of particular statements in where, wherever about engagement, the point is, Every document you take in pedagogy curriculum or whatever says you've got to engage children. There is not even concept here of engagement on slide one. There's not even it's not even it's not even written there, let alone addressed. Right? These are important things. Phonological awareness. I had a problem here with um, uh, trying to post this um, the, 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 with the formatting. So phonological, phonemic awareness, whatever. So what do we have here? Use jolly phonics, a catamat, right? So what is it? This is just an exercise again. There's no purpose. There's nothing. Kids just repeat whatever we tell them. So this is just if you look, look, students, it's Akara does lots of things, and there and we will discuss it. And there are resources, especially towards the later weeks, um, the YouTube videos. I discuss how to work with a curriculum. The curriculum has many uh, um, levels of outcomes. And I've discussed it, I'm sure, in other collaborate sessions. The key outcomes in the of the curriculum are not for year one or two or three. They are the capabilities. They are the, the general capabilities, the key higher order thinking skills on which everything actually hangs. If you do not address those general capabilities, those higher order skills, they will not happen in your class. Consequently, everything becomes low level activities. Now we do A, then we do some rhymes, 
then we do this, then we do that. And somehow we hope like crazy that kids will put it together into ability to actually pass an upland test. But it won't happen because not, there's, there might not be actually that much bad with an upland test. It's just the way we understand it. So these are small level outcomes. Students will be able to do this and to do this. What's the comprehension concept? Did you know that pronunciation and hearing is actually comprehension? Because if the word, if, if actually information was so available straight and directly into our ears, then we wouldn't need that big brain to process it. Do you know how processing happens? The processing happens as, as follows. The sound hits your ear. You know what happens? You think you hear? No, that's what my mother thought. Or maybe my grandmother. But the 21st century teacher should know that when this wave of a sound hits the ear, it goes right to the front of the head, links with number of systems there, which together they say, I think we heard cat because we also heard other sounds. And meaning wise, it seems it said a cat sits on the mat. Oh, the brain says, all right, takes this message, sends it back to the ear and to the systems which sit near the ear and the, and you think you heard ear that's the moment when once the brain processed then it sends it back to your ear and you think you just heard but you actually heard it much earlier isn't it funny it's really funny so the point i'm making all these low level um all these low level outcomes are extremely important, but unless they are integrated in, a, in an activity which is richer, bigger, which involves comprehension, which involves negotiation, what do you think I heard? What do you think happened? What else could have been there? How else can I ensure that these things actually happened? Maybe they didn't happen. All these dialogues, internal dialogues must happen in the head of a child. It's called negotiation. So that then the kid says, I know it was cat. You think they heard it, they didn't hear it, they interpreted it. And it's very, very important. We don't hear, we interpret. And we don't just interpret the meaning of, you know, what happened to the Red Riding Hood when she saw the cat, uh, the wolf. We interpret at the level of actually hearing a word. All right, so outcomes, very important. I want references to the curriculum, but we need to understand that in order for students to actually master these outcomes, they have to relate it to other outcomes in order to, for the, in order to assure that the meaning is made, that the connections are rich between the outcomes, that they reinforce one another. And they can only do that in the context of a larger activity which has a purpose, so they know that the cat will be because it's a children's story and because it's for them, right? But if we said uh, something like, um, think of some complicated word in science, they obviously will not, even if they can hear it, they won't, they won't repeat it because they don't have systems that would reinforce comprehension or hearing. So low level, yes, but they have to be integrated in the high level activities in order for actually children to have a chance to actually achieve them. It's an illusion just because they say cat and you say to them cat and they repeat cat that they actually understood something. It's an illusion. They all, all might have understood, you know, whatever they master, it was very minute, minimal, it's going to disappear. And it's not going to actually work for them in lesson two, lesson three, lesson 200. Okay, so let's have a look what we have here. We're still with the mat, right? We haven't progressed much. We're still, so students are given now a sheet of paper. How many kids want to work with a sheet of paper? Some of them do. And what do they do? They draw the, mat, the monsters, but that's fine. When you deal actually with children who are more rebellious and more um, uh, self-reliant, very often Aboriginal children are called, but they're very self-reliant. They don't want the they, they tell me straight away when, when they come to my classes to my lectures they say Anya if the teacher comes to us with that you know pile of boring sheets of paper and pens we just walk out right so what, what, what I'm saying is sheet of paper was actually good when I was little but now they they know the world is bigger all right so students are given a sheet of paper with pictures and words from the book on them all right and students are then given numerous you see students are given given and then requested to do things. They are given things and requested to do things. They're given things and requested. What, what are children actually giving to us? 
here, here do we create an atmosphere that you see classroom is a social context where their mothers like it or not and in fact many of children do call teachers their mothers why because they sit with the teacher for eight hours a day right so it's a social context and therefore it's a love based context right we need to love each other there's nothing else in life everything else is just an excuse to love differently um so we have a social context and we just give them things so that they can give to us we request things from them we request request he's the sheet of paper now you do this he's the word now you read it he's the thing you do that we leave them dry they have nothing to give to us we need to think how can we create an atmosphere that they are just dying to do things for us right so that's the sort of principle you need to think about so students are then given numerous newspapers and magazines and are asked to cut out the letters and match the letters in the book right per se not a bad activity per se not a bad activity but it's where it ends it's a kind of like an activity in itself doesn't have a doesn't have a connection to all the things which which come out from the child so the child can actually relate that if i do this and this and this then i can actually i don't have to actually write the letter mom i can just cut out stuff from the newspaper and put it there so it's easier they think it's easier but in fact they do all the processing nevertheless right so act the activity is great, but because it has no purpose, it's just an exercise, it kind of looks flat. So once students have cut out the letters, they will then paste the letters under the matching letters from the book. And that's a lesson. Okay, so, so that they pasted them. Let's have a look what happens next. Nothing. Now we move to vocabulary. All right. Vocabulary is a key component of reading for meaning. Well not only vocabulary so why are we stick why are we why are we just focusing on the vocabulary i'll give you a test this is a very interesting test back to phonics what else would you suggest be added to that activity i don't want i have said it before i don't want that activity what i said is one needs to think but it's a good point laurie um well one needs to think is What's it, what, what is any activity in which we engage students gonna act, uh, what's, what's the purpose of it? What's the social, emotional, uh, critical and creative purpose behind it? There's no activity such as phonics. There used to be, but there isn't in the 21st century. If people do it, they're wrong. What do you mean Desley by children's learning? Anyway, so basically we want to reach... Well, they're going to get something out of it. There's going to be a purpose. Right. So there's nothing wrong if children learn, with children to learn how to sound out things and how to and how to how to actually match letters with sounds and actually take the newspaper and cut out the words out of it or letters because they do matching they do matching and they do creativity creative activity because they actually stick them on a card which they will give to their mother for the Mother's Day. Oh, they are emotionally involved. They love their mother or their carer. They might even do it for the teacher or something, you know. They might actually do um, a competition whereby, well, not even competition, but remember how I wrote um, somewhere on the postings, I said, say, for example, you have a conference or you have a teacher's uh, or parent's day or parent's night at school. And how do you engage children in it? Well, children could actually create stickers where their parents will be sitting, right? So you, you give them a thing and they just take a newspaper and they think they have a shortcut because they don't have to write. They can just take things from the newspaper and put it on the sticker and that will be their name. Amazing. Imagine how they feel. My mom is going to sit there where I told her. I did this thing for her. I'll just now cut out from the newspaper little hearts because I found it now and I put a doll there and I put a truck. And, and all other things, and I draw a monster, and that's where my mommy will be sitting. Amazing. Isn't it hard? Isn't it just grabbing your heart when this happens? Um, I'll give you an example. Maybe that will teach you a little bit of how to think about high level, high or high level activities or rich tasks or h higher order tasks. I'll give you an example. I was running in November a symposium, a major symposium with big professors from all over the place. Okay. And someone on my behalf, without actually letting me know 
the, the thing, ordered a banner for that symposium. And you'd think, cool, when people come, they will see it says symposium, blah, blah, that this is the title, challenges in um, whatever, global learning or something, there'll be a banner, people will know where to walk, where to find it, great. Do you know how much the symp that, that banner was? I still remember, I almost cried when I saw it. On the, on the bill, I was charged $738. I had only $10,000 to spend. I was flying our students from all over Australia. I was flying students from uh, overseas. I was flying speakers from overseas. How much do you think I can cover with $10,000? And the banner alone was almost $1,000. I was mortified because I had my postgraduate students. What are my postgraduate students, do you think, doing? They teach five-year-olds. What do you? Th how do you think these five-year-olds would feel if they saw at the university a banner that they created themselves? They'll take their parents and do pictures of it. And I would get parents to come to the bloody symposium, right? <laughs> Point is, look how the creativity was wasted and the money paid for something that I didn't really need. I could have had children, I could have done without the banner. But, but So that experience with the banner taught me a lot. And especially it taught me, look how much creativity is available in our classrooms. And yet we pay some printery that probably didn't even want to do it. They probably thought it was extravagant and it was. Okay, so leaving that aside about the tasks, how you can, how to, how to think of major tasks. And I have also read the postings. I spoke about, you know, creating uh, evenings with parents or creating film nights. You know, the children don't have to create a, a, a 90 minute movie. They can create a little story or they can tell other children uh, how to do things. So the li little films about t telling about the school so that a six year old creates a video for a five year old to get actually adjusted to the school. All kinds of all kinds of useful activities we can think of whereby the children are part of the community, they feel like a part of the community, and then when new ones come in, they invite them as part of the community. And that covers your um, 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 emotional and, and emotional um, general capability. These are very important. We need to think people are multidimensional. They're not just creatures to actually um, repeat things. Now, um, on the notion of, on the concept of vocabulary, absolutely. Vocabulary is, well, put it this way, vocabulary is an invention of the linguist. But let's think that vocabulary is important. It's not necessarily a key component. There are many key, key um, components. The good thing is, but I am not a native speaker of English. I actually speak, I can't remember anymore, let's assume five or six languages. So I've had an experience to actually understand how the how all these meanings actually work. And I had, I've experienced this in a very personal way. Now, when you actually speak English all your life, and if you never actually learned another language, you think you take certain things for granted. But for example, when you create a sentence, like Anya, back to phonics. What else should you say? Would, would you suggest? What makes you, con you what makes you choose particular words? What th that you think will go into this particular sentence in order to actually for the other person to understand? How do you make these choices? I think. Do you think that you have learned? Uh, sentences and you just repeat them? Obviously not. You make choices. So what motivates those choices? If it was just vocabulary, then you wouldn't have this. Then, then you wouldn't think now. You would say, well, well, I don't know. If it was vocabulary, I don't know. Vocabulary is such a low level uh, item, but I can't even, f it doesn't have an organizing power. What organizes our choices? Our knowledge about the world, doesn't it? I have a thought. Hey? I, could, I couldn't hear. Oh, yeah. Okay. I was just saying you use a lot of higher order thinking skills to reflect on knowledge. You, you, th that's, that is true, but you also have to have some sort of understanding of the world, even if it is on your terms, 
in order to actually know in order to actually know what comes with what right so if we look at the magnificent sentence that like culture right understanding of the world let's call it let's call it let's call it yeah we can call it culture for, for argument's sake i'm happy with that so if we look at the organizing structure that Lori wrote when she actually called my attention, she said, Anya, how did she know to, to start the sentence with Anya? What, what prompted that? Because she, it's not the vocabulary, it's the understanding of the world that if she wants to call someone's attention, this is how you do it. And then she wrote skillfully, back to phonics, what did she do? She then said, Anya, I will now, I want to focus you on the concept of phonics. I know we're talking about something else, but I want you to go back. So she focuses me. She focused me first by calling me. She didn't say back to phonics. She first called me. So the first level, the first step was covered. Then the second, back to phonics, right? So what actually organizes the structure in her sentence is not vocabulary, it's her knowledge of the world, how you do things how you do things when you want these particular things to happen. So very often I talk in my lectures about things like exploration activities when you take children through particular, um, through activities where children have a chance to actually look at the world, what people do, who does it, um, when they do it, why they do it, how they do it, right? And they compare and contrast and they can see that if someone just used vocabulary or I don't know what and said, what would you suggest otherwise, I probably would have missed it. Because it would have been, the, the sentence would have been constructed incorrectly. But when Laurie quite correctly says, Anya, I'm there, my eyes are there. Then she says, back to phonics. Okay, I know now where to look. And then she says, now what would you like to suggest otherwise? And I go, okay, now I can answer this question. It was magnificently structured sentence, but it was informed not by vocabulary, but her knowledge of the world and how language helps her to communicate or to work with that knowledge. How language helps her to actually reflect the organization of the world that she has in her head. So we need to actually have a look at what people do, not just at vocabulary. Because vocabulary performs and enables us to perform the things that we want to communicate and that we know about from our knowledge of the world. So the meaning is not in the vocabulary. The meaning is actually in the world's practices. And then we link the words to those practices and then we try to actually arrange these words in such a way so that they enable us to actually reflect what language does in order to show the intentions we want to pass. I think that got a bit complicated because I was thinking of something else now. But you know, you know there's a world and the language helps to actually, language, the knowledge, the knowledge about how to actually mix words comes from the world not not from the vocabulary itself the vocabulary itself doesn't say anything so we need to actually expose children to what people do and how and when and all of that so that people can actually observe how language works in situations because the language itself doesn't have a meaning now i have started some point before which was interrupted but or i interrupted myself but basically what i wanted to say is as follows language is music writing is so the music is in the right hemisphere the language as an analytical tool is in the left hemisphere right what children have they have language at five at four they have this thing in the right hemisphere pretty much going but the left hemisphere is empty well in, in, at least in terms of language of writing pardon me and writing and reading so how do you now start creating dots in the left hemisphere what they need to do is actually use what they have in the right hemisphere, which is the knowledge about the language in the world, and put it now into words, right? We don't teach them just words. We need to actually use what they have, which is the knowledge of the world, which is the right hemisphere, and now think of how we can integrate writing 
in a way that actually relies on what they already have, which is the knowledge of the world. And in fact, that's how literacy and writing and reading evolved my lecture last week. That's how it evolved and that's how it should be taught. It didn't evolve as a skill, it evolved, literacy is a tool, it's not a skill. Right? It's a tool, so that it's a tool that we created, our culture created this tool, not this particular tool, every, other, some other cultures do it differently, but we have actually reading and writing the way we have it, we created a tool, so that what's in our right hemisphere, we can now represent with our left hemisphere. Right? So it's very important. So that's that notion of the, of the world being present and world being the source, being the place, where, or being the um, the reference of all the organi of of the organization how sentences should be created. Right? Then, in a sense, it's not the vocabulary that is the key component of meaning, but it's the world. How funny, isn't it? How we can turn everything around. It's very important. You can see that the references are here, 1997, and I'm not. I don't have a problem. You need to read, but the reason why I'm not sticking to any textbook is exactly this. I cannot control what people write, but I can control how I work with you with those texts. So, there. Let's have a look at the next thing. Describing words, and why would they be doing this? Again, you see the same problem. Why should they be doing this? And, and, and where's the knowledge of the world? When people describe words, how do they describe it? Do you think it does matter how people describe it? It does. I, I've spoken about it before. If you meet a girlfriend and someone says to you, the girlfriend at the coffee shop says to you, so did you see that movie? And you say, yeah, how was it? Oh my God. Right? That's one description. And another one is that when, when you write a report to the newspaper about the same movie, you say, you don't say, oh my God, and that's it. You actually write a story, a, a commentary. You use different, different um, liter literacy tools to actually reflect what you would like, that the moods, the kind of um, experiences that the movie um, evoked in you, right? It's a complex thing. So description is not just a description, but we reduce it to description. And then we wonder in a year two or three, but we've created people that have no skills. Well, we didn't teach them that, and then we blame them. So description is not a description. Description has a purpose. And unless this purpose is actually somehow um, included or embedded in an activity, there's again the same situation. It's like talking you know, it's like it's like training children. Say, cats say they describe this, describe this, describe this, describe it. And children sometimes say, well, how am I going to describe it? The kid is the kid who knows everything about the world. You know that five-year-old boy who can do anything other than function in your class, right? They can do anything. And the reason they can often function in the class because they know so much about the world. They know the description just is not a description. And we say, can you describe? And they go like, like how do you want me to describe it? And you get really irritated and you go, well, you don't know what how to describe because you're asking them to play a pedagogic game. But they think of description as a as a as a literacy tool. And they know that, you know, to daddy they describe it differently because daddy likes tinkering with stuff. To mommy they describe it differently because she wouldn't know what this tinkering is all about, right? So that to mommy they say it was just lovely. It was just lovely, mommy. I really love the people there. And to daddy you say, ah, oh, there were these things there and blah and blah. Describing the same thing differently. So describing words, there's a danger in positioning things like this because you literally, literally from the year of from the age of five, you're teaching them you something that you will have to unteach them later on. Now you teach them there's just a description, and when they are seven or eight, you have to tell them, well, there's not just a description, now there's complications. And they go, oh my God, now we have to unlearn it and learn some more complications. And that brings what people call the linear reading, uh, uh, learning, which means, you know, linear, which means we sequences. First we give them a little bit, then we give them more, then we give them more, then we give them more. Now you don't need me to teach you a methodology like this. That's been done for over a hundred years. I don't need to be paid whatever I'm paid to teach you this. Everybody has gone through it. Anybody can do it. My mother can do it. But that's not methodology of teaching, not 21st century pedagogy. This is a pedagogy of something that you know has been done forever. 
And if it was right, and if it was correct, we wouldn't need all this research, we wouldn't need all these people engaged in literacy to actually find ways out of it. Because, you know, well, we've done it in 1915, why don't we do it today? So again, low level outcomes. There's no reference to higher order skills. There's no general capabilities here. There's no motivation. There's no um, empathy. There is just, just where's the human being here? Right? The human being is not here. All right. Comprehension. All right. This is I love the term comprehension because because what is comprehension? Okay, guys, guess. Of course, you will not guess what I have in my mind. But if you could think of comprehension, what do you think is a comprehension? If someone says to me, Anya, now do you think I'll comprehend it? If, if Laurie said Anya in her typing, what does comprehension of that signal mean? Well, I know it's my name, but what is comprehension? So Laurie types Anya. Ah, that just doesn't do. Understanding the context of what is being said. Well, what is the? It's Alina. It's uh, it's 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 kind of not clear enough. How did Laurie know that I understood? Okay, maybe I should know better. I, I should frame it better. How did Laurie? Laurie, when she said Anya, blah blah. How did Laurie know that I understood when she said Anya? Because you answered. Ah, absolutely. Beautiful. So comprehension is actually a response. Right? You will not find it anywhere else, but in, in sentences written by most beautiful semioticians in the world. And his name is Bakhtin. And Bakhtin was contemporary to Vygotsky, but it wasn't like Vygotsky. Bakhtin is just music. He's beautiful. And he laid out he laid out uh, foundations for the modern field of semiotics and genre. Right? So Bakhtin says comprehension is response. It's a response. And when I respond, what do I do? I didn't just look at her. I went through the process of elimination what are not good responses, right? So response is already a process of evaluation. I didn't respond because it's somehow I've got in my brain a message that one day someone calls my name and then I have to respond in this particular. I could, resp de de depending how it's written and so on, I would have responded differently. So I assess the situation and I evaluated what is the correct response and I acted. So then that gave Laurie a confidence that I understood it and I understood her calling me the way she intended to be understood. So comprehension is, needs to be defined. So when we want children to comprehend, we need, the, we need to define. So comprehension is a response and the response itself already is an outcome of evaluation of what would be the best way to ex respond so that because I produce my response thinking about it how you will respond to my response so in order for you to respond the way I want you to respond so that I'm thinking how you're gonna respond so therefore I respond in the way so that you respond to me the way I want you to respond you got it that's the dance that's the dance. Yep, conversation. Exactly. So that's the dance. Whenever you open your mouth, you're thinking how best you can frame it so that the responses from my students like now or from the responses from your interlocutor actually will come up with something that you actually, that will either not happen because they understood it, Either way, the response you want from your interlocutor is predicted by you and is expected. So if I say the movie was really, how was the movie? You know, my girlfriend asked me, how was the movie? I go, oh my God. I know exactly what her response will be. I told you, I told you not to go. <laughs> so she got it, right? So when I said, oh my God, I said it on purpose, knowing that she already will say that. But if I don't want her to say it, I say, well, it was still worth seeing, you know. So I, I, and she will not say I told you not to go because I predicted that she would tell me that she told me. So uh, I would say, well, 
you know, um, it was still worth going. You know, it's, it's a classic. One should see these things to have an opinion. So I could have said, oh my God, and give her the whole the credit that she was right. Or I could just counteract it and prevent it so that she doesn't have high ego, right? So comprehension is a complex system. Well, let's have a look. How not to actually, I suggest how, how this is that in this draft and how maybe we can do it better. So after reading the book, and what happens now? We think that students understood the book, but there's so many things happening in the book. And there are so many children with so many different heads, this, if they listen to you, there are so many children with so many different heads listening to you. What, is it, what, was, what response did you expect, right? When you read to children, and it happens all the time, I mean, I quite often still get lesson, um, well, they're not called lesson plans, but the resources written uh, to me, where students say, I'll oh, just read the book to them. I still get them. So my question is, what, compre what, what is it that you, ex what reaction did you, what response did you expect from them to call it comprehend? Uh, nothing, Anya. Now we go through the exercises, right? So they were just sitting there. They had no idea why they were listening. So they had no idea what to evaluate. And now you're testing them on something that you didn't, but it was not the communication. Comprehension is an outcome of communication. If you read to them and there was no context of communication, what did you want them to comprehend? Imagine a coffee shop. You go, there are people that they have no idea they should be listening to you or whatever. You pick up the text and you start reading. And some of them listen and some not, but doesn't matter. Let's assume they all listen, but they don't know why, because you just, you just, you just are reading. And then you do a test on what you read. They had no idea what you read. That they had no idea what was there to be understood. They just look at you weird when you ask them comprehension questions. So comprehension happens only in the context of communication. And it, and and it, and communication is an exchange of responses. Right? It's not like children sitting there not knowing what's happening. Lots of children ask you to read to them. I have started asking that to read to me and look at, they look at me, at, right. Point is, why do children ask you to read to them? Because, first of all, they don't do any work. Second of all, how can they ask you to do things they have no idea about? Now you go to Poland and no children will ask you for oysters for lunch. We don't, have, when I was little, we didn't have oysters. Right? I mean, if someone told me that I would be eating crab, I would tell you never, never in my life, because the crab, the concept of the crab I had in Poland and there, the, the ones we have here, are completely different. So they ask you to read, not the idea is, oh, if they ask me, that's what they want. No, that's what they know. No, that's not what they want. You need to give children options. Education is about expansion. It's not about. When children live in the family home and in their community, community socializes them. So what it does, it says certain things are on and certain things are not on. But education says, well, now you came here to get expansion, not socialization. We're not going to reduce you. We want to make you bigger. We want you to reflect on the intentions that drive you, the intentions that, that motivate you, the intentions that are underneath the interpretations that you set up. Right? So comprehension back again is only happens in communication and only happens when there's a response that there's an exchange of responses when there's no and that, that exchange of responses you can actually call interaction. And there's no interaction here kids are sitting and then just are being told the story. All right so after reading the book a fat cat Okay, fat cat. Students are issued with a piece of paper with images from the book. We've done it before, haven't we? Students need to study the images. What does that mean? And fill in the missing letters. Right, they did the exercises. Now we're testing their short memory. Now, an amnesia, a person with amnesia would do that well, but a person with, with amnesia will not say that the cat, like, look at these four pictures, that the cat would doesn't want to sit on the mat because he's seeing a mouse because he wants to catch the mouse and then he will be a fat cat because he's eating the mouse and the person with amnesia will not say that the person with amnesia cannot connect things but the person with amnesia can recall they can write cat mouse mat whatever the cows come home 
A chimpanzee can do it too perfectly, even better than human beings. Right? What is it that we want? Creativity and critical thinking is about, is about exploring tools, exploring resources, putting things together in a bigger whole, in an increasingly more powerful systems. When children explore, how much does it do for me? How much does it do for me? How much does it do for me? Here is just, an, uh, uh, just again, a small detailed exercise. Um, I dread to call it behavioristic, but pretty much um, at, that, at the same sort of level of, um, of paradigm. W what's here to be comprehended? I mean, where's the comprehension here? What response do we want from children? It's not comprehension. This is testing their memory. You need to be very careful. So I'm glad we looked at this draft today because it gave us a chance to um, to basically um, pull out some uh, some um, key issues from which, which are important to us in designs and actually now see how problematic they are, how much they involve, and what they actually mean. So it was actually a lesson today why we actually did look at the design, but what we with, with, with this draft that was given by our brave student first to us, what, what happened was with this draft gave us an opportunity to now reflect on the concepts that we will be using in our assignment too, and made us very aware that nothing is as simple as we might have seen in schools, or we might have interpreted other people to say. Right? I'm gonna leave it here for many reasons because it's, we've been here at it for an hour and that's just enough for the day. And you've got other resources online. So I'll be very happy to answer one question or so and we'll just call it the day, okay? So any questions? No, I have no questions. It's been very interesting, no, thank you. Okay, so you probably still will have to re-listen to this uh, lesson on YouTube if you want to actually solidify these things. But the main thing here is we've got capabilities and we work with these capabilities with joy, not with anger, not with resentment, yeah. but with joy. Oh my God, we're going to make kids do the labels for the tables for, cheer for, for their parents. We're going to make them do movies. We're going to make them do poems. We're going to make them do stuff. And even if I get it wrong, at least we did a large activity and Anya will give me plans for it and I will. Because I'm again, I have to repeat it again. I'm, I, what I want to say in PowerPoint is an attempt to use, to engage in the unit. I don't need perfection. I just need to see an attempt to engage in the unit. All right. So I will. Okay. okay so Thank you very much for your presence. I really appreciate it, your, your time here. So would, and I, we have one question. So would an activity for this book, as an example, be for children to spell the words from the book using clay, play-doh? And creating what? And creating what? All right. It's very important, Laurie and everyone else, um, we engage children first in exploration of the world around us, what's happening today around us, who's doing these things, why are people doing things, how can we contribute to it, and then get them together to actually con uh, conceptualize an activity that we could all engage and find ways of actually going about it, which require literacy as a tool, but in fact, they are a way of engaging or community, communicating with the community. If I were you, I would type those words I just said because I will never say them again. So <laughs> if you actually listen to this YouTube video again, just play the last minute because it just has everything I want to say. Creating the words using different materials. There is no communication here happening. There's no engagement. There's no learning about the community and therefore about oneself. And then as a result, it is still a low level um, activity. I am fully aware it's a very difficult concept to grasp. That's why I want our students to start posting even lesson one drafts on the forum, because then we can see how we think about it. And then through different ways, we can actually help each other how to actually deal with these concepts of a richer 
activity or higher level activity and so on and what communication is and learning about community communication is about engaging with the communities children can't engage with the community until we give them opportunities to learn about this community and what is happening and how and why and all of these things and i've covered all of that in every pretty much youtube video i have produced Yes, that's very good, Laurie. That's pretty much good. We just have to move because what I need to do is to prepare you to be teachers, not just today in some school where you are doing a prac, where maybe one teacher is doing one thing or another. I have to make sure that you have a job in 10 years time. That's my objective. That's why it is in an academic unit. It is, well, you have prac units and they do whatever they do. But with me, you do an academic thinking as well. And, and I need to make sure that you actually hold the job and actually do it as a leader. All right, thank you very much. I will upload it on YouTube. It should be there within some time. I have a dinner now with friends because I'm away from Darwin, but uh, it will be there tonight. Okay, so I just close it for today. And thank you very much. Thank you everyone for your contribution. And thank you to the student, whoever will listen to this video for the uh, draft as well. All right, thank you very much. You too. Thank you very much.